Good evening. and Welcome to our evening worship at First Christian Reformed Church. We're really glad that you're here with us. A special welcome to anyone visiting with us and those watching on a screen somewhere. We're glad that you've chosen to join us. What a blessing it is to begin and end our day gathered together to worship our God and to rest in his salvation. God calls us to worship this evening with these words from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. If you're able, I'd invite you to stand as we open our worship this evening, singing Christian Hearts in Love United. If you looked ahead this evening, you'll see that we're going to cover the book of Jude tonight, the whole book. It seems crazy, but it's only 24 verses long, or 25, so it shouldn't be too bad. But part of Jude, there is a very beautiful welcome and greeting, and there's a very beautiful doxology, and those are both going to be part of our service tonight. So God greets um, his people with these words from the book of Jude. To you who are called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen. We'll continue our worship in song. Uh, you're, you can sit for the first couple and we'll stand for the third.
We're going to talk about false teachers tonight and being on guard against false teachers. And a, a great way to do that, aside from just knowing the Bible deeply and memorizing it and, and, and putting it to heart, is to know these confessions of faith, to know what we believe and what we teach as a church and what Christians across all time and places have believed. So join in confessing our faith. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, come before God and worship him with our prayers. Would you please join me in a time of congregational prayer? Most high God, what a blessed privilege it is to come to you, to come to you to this place and worship you. And we're especially grateful that we worship you freely without fear of persecution or uh, having our services monitored by the states or anything along those lines, but we can come to gather as people of many different professions, uh, many different ages, uh, people from all walks of life to gather and worship you. What a, a wonderful testament to your majesty, Lord, that you reach across any kind of barriers that we make between uh, the genders, between uh, our monetary status, between races, between uh, any, anything that we might do to divide ourselves. Lord, you transcend all of that, and you call for yourself a people, a people that you loved from the foundations of the earth and a people that you keep in Jesus Christ until his great day. Lord, we know that you are righteous. We know that you are ultimately holy, set apart from all other things. Lord, we know that there is a day coming when you will execute your sure judgment on your enemies. And Lord, we know that we are only safe on that great day of judgment if we are in Christ Jesus, that he is the ark, so to speak, that he is our great savior and redeemer. He delivered us from our sins while we were still enemies, while our hearts still rebel against him to this very day. He delivered us from sin. And in Christ alone, we can know the fullness of salvation. And we can be assured that we are at peace with our God. Help us, Lord. Grant us uh, grace as we attempt to walk the holy life that you've called us to. Guide us with gentle correction when we come up against our shortcomings. Teach us to more earnestly seek you out every day of our lives and follow after you with our whole hearts. Lord, we pray that you grant each of us faith as that firm foundation upon which we stand and know of our salvation. Lord, we give you thanks this evening that you will meet us in your word as we come before you, not just to gather as a social club, not to merely get together and sing some songs and listen to some guy talk. But Lord, it's through your word and through the sacraments that you meet your people in a very real way, that you commune with us and you let us know that we belong to you. And we know, Lord, that it's you alone who can keep us from falling. We ask, Lord, that you would be gracious to us in this way. Help us in our unbelief. Help us in our doubt. Help us, Lord, to not forget to th this great salvation to which we've been called. Lord, as we look around, we think of so many things that we need to pray for. 
Uh, we, we come with gratitude for the beautiful weather we've enjoyed this week. It's hard to believe we're enjoying such beautiful days to do that last bit of work outside. Um, and we ask God that um, as the temperatures change, we'd be grateful for the colder weather too and grateful for the changing seasons. We look at our world, Lord, and it seems to be a mess. There's, there's wars, certainly, and there's hostilities and groups that seem to have hate for one another. God, we pray that you bring an end to all of that. But Lord, we also pray that you would be um, lavish in showering mercy on those who truly suffer in all this. The internally displaced persons, the widows, the orphans, the homeless, those who are um, truly losing everything right now, though they're not a combatant. Lord, we pray for our nation. We look around, and, and right now, Lord, uh, everywhere we turn, there seems to be political advertisement and blame for the condition of things. There's uncertainty. There's a great deal that seems off in this world. We pray, Lord, that our leaders would realize that they are ordained by you for your service to lead your people. And we pray, God, that they would seek your wisdom as they make decisions and that they would govern righteously. And Lord, as Thanksgiving is approaching this week, we pray, Lord, that all of us would um, be reminded of how much we have to be grateful for. We pray, God, for safety as people travel on this Thanksgiving weekend. Some go near, some go far, but wherever people are gathered, Lord, we pray that they are safe, that they are filled with grateful hearts, and ultimately are grateful to you for providing us all that we stand in need of. We're grateful, Lord, for this community, that it's a pretty safe place to live, a safe place to worship, a safe place to be a Christian, and the blessing that that is. We pray, God, that you would keep this community um, in your care. You would help it to continue to be a safe place and help us, Lord, as we seek to serve our community in a variety of different ways, whether that's in the medical field or teaching, uh, whatever it is that we do in this place. Um, help us to be grateful for this place and to seek to serve the lost in this place. And Lord, we pray for our church. Pray for uh, all these people gathered here, all the members of our church, those who aren't able to come, our shut-ins. We pray, Lord, that you would be near to them. We pray, God, that they would be comforted and that they would know the, the warmth of our fellowship and that we do uh, hold them very dearly. We pray for our search committee, Lord, that they might be filled with wisdom as they seek out our next shepherd. And we pray for that next shepherd, Lord, that you would open his eyes and help him to know with full confidence that he can serve you well in this church. Lord, we pray um, for the Middle East Reformed Fellowship, uh, this offering that we're going to take tonight. We ask God that you would richly bless the work that they do in raising up missionaries to go to the Middle East. We pray, God, that our offerings would be done with a grateful heart and would richly bless that organization. Lord, bless our worship, be with us, and turn our hearts towards you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time we'll worship God with our offerings for Middle East Reformed Fellowship. May God bless the gifts that we give.
So grateful for the many wonderful musicians we have in our church. This morning was a, a testament to that, uh, how gifted this church is musically, and, and what a blessing that, that is. Um, before we open God's word this evening, I invite you to stand as we sing a hymn of preparation, Seek Ye First the Kingdom. invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to do the book of Jude, second to last book in the Bible. It's a, a fairly short letter, and it has this kind of one big theme and message, so it, it didn't make sense to split it up, um, but rather to focus on the full contents of what Jude writes to the church. Before we read, let's turn to God in prayer. Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. Lord, without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these are merely words on paper. But Lord, we know that by your Spirit, these words are the words of life. Help us to receive them as such and be with us as we read and study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's the book of Jude. And we'll stop at verse 23 because I'm going to use the doxology at the end. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only Savior and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. 
They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand, and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals. These are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way and all of the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We think about the armor of God quite a bit. There's, there's a lot of images in the Bible of warfare. A great deal of the Old Testament is about actual warfare. And there's many references to it, an imagery of warfare in the New Testament. We think of this invading army in a, a very traditional war, two armies squared off against each other. But Jude shows us the nature of the crafty serpent. Satan knows that he cannot win by being an invading force, by taking on the armies of the Lord in what you might call traditional warfare. And so instead he uses spies. He uses imposters, people to sneak in and sabotage the church of Jesus Christ from the inside. This resistance force takes many forms, and sometimes, often, really, it's difficult to detect. But we have to be on guard against it, for it'll wreak havoc in the world and in the church and in the life of Christians everywhere. And while it, it may not remove salvation from people, It'll cause untold harm to believers. As introduction, Jude is, uh, he's a half-brother of Jesus Christ. He, He doesn't introduce himself that way. He introduces himself as a servant or a slave in some translations. He didn't come to this position of being able to write a letter to the church and and carrying some weight of authority. He doesn't appeal to his blood relation in Jesus. I think he knows the nature of rebellion, having grown up with Jesus, but not actually believing in him until after the resurrection. Jude is, is kind of an interesting personality along with James. 
He's writing a warning to the church. He says he meant to write about salvation and and teach us something of the doctrine of salvation, but he felt the need to give us this warning, to urge us, to beg us to contend for the faith. We don't know who this apostate group is. There's suspicion based on the arguments he makes that it's an early variety of the Gnostics who believed that there was a secret knowledge uh, to be had, and that was the way of salvation. Um, But nonetheless, there are ungodly teachers kind of weaseling their way in with smooth words and leading the people of God astray. And so Jude calls us in verse 3 to contend for the faith. What's this faith that we're supposed to contend for? Throughout his arguments, and we're going to dive a little deeper into this, we see that the faith is historic and that it produces godliness or or holiness among its adherents and that it submits to the lordship and authority of Jesus Christ. And those three things are all that are rejected by these false teachers. These false teachers reject authority, They reject the moral law, and they reject Jesus Christ. First, we'll look at their rejection of authority. They they don't believe in what's been given down. They don't believe in the faith that was handed down through the apostles. They don't believe in the authority that the church would hold. We were told to contend for a faith that was given once for all, that it was handed to the prophets and the apostles, the faith that was given directly from Jesus Christ to the apostles, or the faith that was spoken through the prophets of old. But these teachers don't stand for that. They have their own way. It says they're driven by their dreams, their, their own vision of what is right. We'll come to see that God is harsh towards this kind of rebellion. That's always true, and it's never been changed. We see several examples of that, in fact, in this passage. You had these teachers, false teachers, coming up with new revelations that spoke new truths about God that somehow superseded the apostolic message. This has continued to go on. It's spoken of here in the Bible, and and we see it in uh, the Church of the Latter-day Saints and and, and other cult-like organizations that abuse the name of Jesus functionally, that they reject it and hold disdain for it and say there's more to the story. That was happening then and that is happening now. We were spoken of and there's a a series of uh, illustrations that look back to the Old Testament times to illustrate this rejection of authority and this way that the people have gone. We see it in verse 11. It says they've taken the way of Cain. Jewish tradition held that Cain was this archetypal sinner and that he led others in the way of sin. And that's largely what was meant by that. They followed the, the first really bad example of human behavior. It says that they followed, they fell into Balaam's error, or they rushed for profit into Balaam's error. This was in Numbers chapter 22, that he was willing to abuse his prophetic gift to make money, to get gain. And that's what these false teachers are doing. They're claiming to have a prophetic gift, and they're not using it for the glorification of God, but for their own upbuilding. It says they're part of Korah's rebellion. I thought I might as well just read this. It's in Numbers chapter 16. And it says, Korah, son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and a certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. 
The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Do you hear the heart of their argument there? Why are you the boss? Why do you get to tell me what to do? These are holy people. These are God's chosen people. What business do you have calling yourself the leader? It's that rebellion, that rejection of any kind of authority. As the people of God, we are people under authority. Even me, I'm under the authority of the elders in our church. All of us are under the authority of the elders in our church. And the church gives some authority to the classes, and that's how we practice these things. And all of us, in a very ultimate sense, in a very real sense, are under the authority of Jesus Christ. We belong to him. We don't get to be these kind of people that insist on having our way, how we want it and when we want it. That's not how this works. And if you go and read the rest of the story, you'll see that God opened up the earth and swallowed these 250 people directly into the earth. He didn't, uh, he didn't much care for that. We are called to be lawful people, people under authority, both in society, which we see in Romans 13, tells us to you know, um, give respect where respect is due, honor where honor is due, to obey the law, to be a, a generally lawful person, so long as it doesn't stand in between us and our faith. But generally lawful and under the authority of government, and we're to be under authority in the church as well. And what happens with these kinds of people, like like those like Korah, with these false preachers? We see in verse 12, um, it calls them uh, blemishes. It refers to them as blemishes. And what this uh, word actually means, it's it's a unique one in the Bible. It, It means a hidden reef or a rock. And so what that would mean back in the day with these people is as though the waters might look clear and steady and even, trying to take a ship over it would ultimately lead to disaster. A blemish is, it's one translation, but that, I think how Jude is using it is in that sense that they'll sneak in and, and while they might appear to be fine, they will shipwreck the people of God. The second thing we see is that these people reject the moral law, any kind of restraint on their behavior. We know that Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial laws of uh, of Moses, but the moral law still stands. In fact, Jesus increased upon it in the Sermon on the Mount, and not so much increased it, but clarified it, that, that it's deeper than you think. Jude tells us these people more or less reduce themselves to animals. They follow those base instincts and are ruled by them, and they teach others to do the same, which is, in a sense, a a rejection of the Imago Dei. It's a rejection of our status as image bearers. These false teachers are shameless. They promote a, a sinful kind of liberty that were worn time and again not to do throughout the New Testament. Because of God's grace, we can do whatever we want without remorse, without guilt, and without shame. That's not the case. In this passage, we can see that the the sure sign of these false teachers, the, the way to recognize them that Jude gives, kind of right up front, is by their ungodly character. Dr. Owen Strachan uh, wrote an article about this and where he identified in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus 1, if you look at the list of qualifications to be an elder in the church of Christ, so much of it is about character. These are, are good, generally good, virtuous, upstanding people that are respected among the body and in society. Those are the people. And Dr. Strachan referred to these false teachers as perhaps the anti-elders. They're the exact opposite of that. 
that their message and their character are tied together and they both lead to destruction. They have no regard for others or for God in leading people astray. We started by saying that they pervert God's grace into a license for immorality. Other versions might say sensuality, which sensuality in our day and age has come to be tied mostly to sexual immorality. But it goes beyond that. It's, it's uh, unbridled lust. It's chasing after every little desire without any restraint. It's these people um, that, that don't put any restraint on their behavior, their thoughts, their words, their deeds, their attitudes. And yet Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, teaches us to restrain all of those things. Not only should you not kill, you should not even become angry. Not only should you not commit adultery, you should not even look lustfully at a woman. There's restraints on our inner self, on our hearts, on our attitudes, not just on our behaviors. And yet these false teachers don't even meet the standard of having good behaviors. The third thing we see is that these false teachers reject Jesus Christ. He's not their God, he's not their master, and he's not their savior. We were not saved to be our own masters. We weren't saved and then set loose to go and do whatever we wanted to do. That's how the deists would see it. It was uh, the, Thomas Jefferson had a Bible and he cut out all the supernatural stuff and, and kind of just held on to his Bible as a, a moral guidebook, so to speak. And, and his belief was that God created the world and he put people in it and then kind of let them free to run their course. But you have to cut out a lot of the Bible to believe that, I think. It almost seems foolish. And yet there's people that believe this. And, and maybe there's people that aren't even, they don't consciously believe this, but they live this way. We know that that's not the case. We're, we were created by God and saved by Christ to do good works for the glory of God. We see it early on in this passage. In that beginning part, uh, it's kind of confusing in the Greek, but it says, to those who have been called, which is an adjective, and then it's followed by two participles, which is a common thing in Greek. And what it does is it kind of sets the conditions. So what it means to be called is that you have been loved by God the Father and that you have been kept for Jesus Christ. And both of those are in the perfect tense. It means they're completed already. The action of the verb is complete. We have been loved by God since before we were formed from the foundations of the world. And we have been kept for Jesus Christ. It's already done. We just need to be obedient to him. In verse 4, we see that uh, for many it's easy to accept Jesus as Savior, but not as the Lord. That he is the, the master that we serve, the sovereign over all creation. There he's referred to as the sovereign and Lord. Doesn't even mention that he's the Savior. So that's, I think, the easy part to grasp sometimes. I think early in my faith that was easy to grasp that Jesus saved me. We know that much. But now that Jesus reigns over me as the sovereign, that all my actions and thoughts and deeds are in submission and in service to him. That's what we were made for. And Jude boldly declares, although subtly, that Jesus is God eternal. It's really a remarkable thing Show of hands. Is anyone reading the ESV tonight, English Standard Version? All right. <laughs> in verse 5, uh, in my Bible, there's a, a footnote on it. But the ESV says, 
wanted to remind you that Jesus delivered this people out of Egypt. And this Bible has a footnote pointing that out. Early manuscripts had Jesus' name there, that Jesus was there in the book of Exodus, walking his people out of, out of Egypt. What a remarkable thing. He is God. He's the God who was. He was with God in the beginning. He is God. Jude makes no subtlety about that. Jesus Christ is God eternal. And what a great comfort it is to know that we belong to Jesus. While these false teachers would reject it, we find it as a great comfort. It's the first question and answer in our catechism. Our great comfort is that we belong, body and soul and life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ didn't save us to be our own master. Jesus saves sinners to worship and serve God alone. So we see these three things, that they reject authority, they reject moral law, and they reject Jesus Christ as God. And so why is this a problem? Why did this need addressing? And I think it comes back to that craftiness of Satan. It reflects the human heart. We always want more. We desire everything. And humans, you'll find them, they can can make an idol out of, I think, literally anything and hold it up into this position of God. All of us to this day are tempted by that original lie. There is really good stuff out there and God's withholding it from you. And if you just take it, you'll be so much happier and you'll, be, you'll know more, you'll be more powerful. You can have it all. That's what our hearts crave. It really should be easy to spot these false teachers, but they're just as crafty as the one who sent them. And they'll tell us what we want to hear. And a lot of people buy into the lies. I felt the need to also offer the balancing act that we shouldn't be maybe uh, putting on our investigator caps to go out and search out and hunt down these false teachers. It's a good thing to identify them and, and call them to repent. But there is a balancing act to be had, to carefully discern rather than to accuse. We see in verse 9 that Michael, the archangel, didn't even have the audacity to judge. Instead, he said, the Lord's going to rebuke you. Jesus taught, and Romans 14 kind of guides us in this to patiently bear with others. That we can hold the orthodox faith, we can believe properly in the gospel message and land with different convictions. And there's room for that in the church of Jesus Christ. So bear with one another until someone demonstrates themselves as a false teacher by rejecting authority, rejecting the moral law, or rejecting Jesus Christ. I think we have an obligation, really, to give the benefit of the doubt to someone who calls themselves a Christian until they give us a really good reason to believe otherwise. You may have heard the little saying to contend without being contentious or to disagree without being disagreeable. And I think that's, that's what I'm speaking to here. Um, we, we should be on the lookout for these people, and I would certainly hope that you guys would call out anyone who stood up here and gave you a false message, even if it were me. Because the glory of God is more important than, than, uh, than anything else. So then at the end of the book of Jude, we get this call to persevere. It gives us the solution. What do we do about this problem of false teachers? They've been there since the beginning. These false teachers have crept in unnoticed and they've led people astray and they cause harm. And so what's the solution to these people? Uh, The first thing we see is in verse three. Um, It's faith. Very simply, the faith that was handed down that there weren't mistakes made. There wasn't too much omitted. What we got 
from the apostles. What we got from the prophets was good. All of it is inspired by the Spirit, and we can trust in this faith, and we can check every new thing we hear against the Word of God. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2. I would have bookmarked it if I knew I was going to it. Paul speaks to it in this way. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. It's by faith. It's by that holy faith that was given us from God that we can stand firm when other people are trying to confuse with false messages. The second thing it gives us is to pray in the Spirit. Galatians 5 speaks to this, but I think more or less we should pray as often as we can. We should take that act of submitting ourselves before God, assuming this posture before God as a creature before its creator. And that, I think, is the heart of prayer. Um, Paul writes this in Galatians Chapter 5. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Our prayers and our lives should be controlled by God's Spirit. And if we're doing that, and if we're seeking out the Spirit, that Spirit that always points us back to Jesus Christ, we won't be led astray. And the third thing we see in this solution towards the end, this this call to persevere, is that we are to keep in God's love, awaiting the mercy of Christ. You know, just the, the Trinitarian pattern there. We pray in the Spirit, we're kept in God's love, awaiting the mercy of Christ of Jesus Christ. All three parts of the Godhead are present here in our call to persevere. We're kept for Christ. Christ has done the the work of salvation. He's redeemed us from sin. But that doesn't take away our responsibility for persevering in it. To stay true in our faith, to not be led astray by these uh, false winds, to not chase after the waterless clouds that promise rain but give nothing. We're to persevere, to stay obedient to God. And I think that just saves us a lot of pain in this life. Pain that we, we don't necessarily need. I think the best way to do this, to keep in God's love and await the mercy of Christ, is by doing this. By coming together in community, We need to gather and hear the word proclaimed. We need to hear God's truth. And we need the encouragement in faith from our brothers and sisters. How many of you have had an encouraging moment here before? About every hand, I suspect. When you're having a hard time, someone comes alongside to bear your burden, to pray for you, to just listen when you need to talk. We need brothers and sisters in the faith. And as the text goes on to show, we can find those people that have doubts and we can encourage them. If people are going down a dangerous path, we can snatch them from the fire with gentle rebuke and teaching. These people living in disobedience are playing a very harmful game. They're playing with fire and they will get themselves burned. And we're given that last warning to be careful that we don't defile ourselves in the process. If we come across someone who's teaching falsely or leading people astray, we need to, to really guard our own hearts in the process. 
so that we are not pulled down into that uh, treacherous path as well. So though there are false teachers in the world, there were in the beginning, there is now and there will be until Christ comes back. They'll find their way into the church and they're going to reject the authority of God. They're going to reject the moral law and say that we can really do whatever we want, whatever feels good. And they'll reject Jesus Christ, maybe not overtly, but they will reject his lordship in their life. And when we come across these people, we come with faith, that ancient faith given to the prophets and apostles. We come with prayer in God's spirit, and we come keeping ourselves in God's love, patiently awaiting, eagerly awaiting the mercy of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks for your word, this message to the church from Jude. We pray, God, that you would help us to guard our hearts, to not be led astray by false teachers, to see false teachers and identify them, that we might be kept from the harm that they bring. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to persevere in faith, to keep ourselves in the love that you have for us, and to patiently and faithfully await your mercy. Lord, we pray that as we go into this next week, you would help us as we do this, walking in faith and in prayer and in your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we respond, I'd invite you to stand as we sing, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. As you go out into the world this week, go with this blessing given us in the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.